You're listening to Write Right with the Story Perfect Editing Team. Visit us at www.storyperfectediting.com for more information on developmental editing, copy editing, and proofreading services for your writing. Season 1, Episode 5. Hello and welcome to Episode 5 of the Write Right Podcast. Uh, today we're going to be talking about semicolons, and the title of this episode is Semicolons. Yay or nay? Um, my name is Ilan. I am an apprentice editor at Story Perfect, um, and I am happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, John? My name is John Robin. I am the senior editor and owner of Story Perfect Editing Services. Um, I also oversee the new apprentice program, helping to train uh, new editors into becoming full editors. Today Hi. I'm drinking oh. lemon ginger tea. I'm Katie. I am copy editor for Story Perfect. And as always, carbonation, straight to the brain if possible. Um, And I'm going to start us off telling you what I am reading. You guys can follow. I'm reading this really amazing book called 13 Ways of Looking at a Fat Girl, um, which is by Mona Awad. And she won an award for this book, although I don't know which one. One of them. But uh, it's just a, a really great sort of satirical story that really hits home if you've ever been judged by your parents or your friends or judged yourself too harshly. And it's also really funny, which is the best way to feel things, in my opinion, is to laugh and then be like, aw, yeah, aw. That way you don't get too sad. <laughs> yeah, that is good. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be able to laugh. That's, I mean, 100% yeah. agree with that. <laughs> what are you reading, John? All right. Uh, right now I'm reading uh, The Name of the Wind by Pat Rothfuss. Um, that's, uh, I've been told by so many people I should read that book, and um, I just got into the part where it switches into first person. I was, to- I was fascinated. I think we were talking about uh, in our previous episode here on yeah. uh, uh, tense and uh, person <clears throat> with narration. Uh, we're talking about that book. So I, got, I was curious how he did it, and it's, it's really interesting. But, I mean, the storytelling is very, it just holds you right there, yeah, the very immediate. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm liking what I read so far. I'm, I'm a very slow reader, but I I, tend, I I find my reading time is bedtime. So that sort of 15 to minute, half an hour window, my mind is most active. And so I, I always like to have something to pick up, uh, yeah. some great story to jump into. Agreed. Yeah, I just, so I haven't started this yet, but I just picked it up. It's a, the first book of The First Kingdom by Jack Katz. Um, Ooh, a fellow English writer recommended to me to get Jack Katz's book. He is uh, evidently he's one of like the grand champions of epic graphic novels, um, and it's this is one For of sure. his most uh, breathtaking works of like crazy science fiction. And I mean, I, I read the Meta Barons and weird Mobius stuff when I was younger, and I just I like these sort of like really bizarre comics. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, we'll <laughs> see how it is. I bet I'm going to like it. Probably. Cool. So without further ado, um, let's talk about the semicolon. Last time we talked about commas, and one of the things that came up frequently was how sometimes commas are actually semicolons. But semicolons can be a bit intimidating, I find. Um, And as I've learned more about them as a writer and an editor, I've found them less intimidating and actually to be incredibly useful. Um, So before we get started, I'd like to give you the definition of a semicolon. It is a punctuation mark, which is signified by a dot with a comma sort of under it. It looks like a colon, but with a comma for the bottom indicating a pause, typically between two main clauses, that is more pronounced than that indicated by a comma. Well, that's pretty clear. Uh, you know. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the semicolon uh, I love, but the, the biggest criticism I've heard of it is not that it's uh, complicated, but that it's antiquated. Um, so people generally, in my experience, know when to use it. They just don't want to. Um, they think it makes it look too formal or, you know, and, and it has been used less and less over time. That's for sure. But I am a fan of it. Um, I mean, I, I put it in my fiction and I, and I don't think that it throws anything off. Um, but maybe I read a lot of work with semicolons in it too. If I see a semicolon in a book, you know, I'm going to buy it. Yeah, That's I probably like it too. Happen. I honestly do like it too. There's a sophistication to it because it's, there's yeah. subtlety in there. 
Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. I, th I think all the punctuation is there to be used for the right uh, opportunity. And, and so I think to throw punctuation away is you're missing out on a lot. Um, yeah, the, the, I agree. the publisher who I first apprenticed with uh, when I started out as an editor had a zero semicolon rule and that used to bother me. I mean, their reason for it was you don't need it. It's that same same argument. It's antiquated in fiction mm -hmm. now. You can achieve most of what you do with a semicolon using M dashes or periods or restructuring the sentence. You shouldn't have a sentence that needs a semicolon. Uh, however, I think there are cases where for the sake of style, uh, you know, if you have a if you have a very intellectual uh, character, say you're doing third person yeah. and you're, you're narrating their scene and they think a lot or they're very, you know, very brainy, uh, they might have long sentences and the semicolon might be the tool for that to bring that across. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, so I, I'm going to keep bringing my experience as a marketing writer just sort of into the fray because I think it's interesting to compare. Um, but the recommendation across the board has been to basically never use them, to completely eschew the use of the of the semicolon in your writing because it, it it seems to make sentences more complicated and we opt as people who are trying to write um, quick punchy things for simple structure we're like we're like going as Hemingway as we possibly can you know uh, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly writers. what I was just thinking um, <laughs> yeah you just like you you completely rip apart any type of convoluted structure or word choice and just get to the heart of it um, but I think that one of the beautiful things about fiction is that you can do these embellishments. You can have this sort of like arabesque flowy, you can put so much into your writing. Um, and yeah. semicolons can really lend a, a tremendous weight to a statement. Um, they can, they, they can do beautiful things. Um, I'm a huge well, and we were talking in the previous episode about brevity and about how that can really have an impact. And uh, I think the semicolon is a wonderful tool to connect brief thoughts because sometimes, you know, if you have these little choppy sentences, it is going to affect how the reader um, is sort of flowing. But if you can connect some of those brief thoughts occasionally with semicolons, it really like you maintain the simple structure, but you improve the flow. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I like that. Yeah, no, it's mm. a great thing. <laughs> yeah, one thing that I run into um, with semicolon is when when do you use it? When do you not use it? Um, it kind yeah. of like the kind of like the comma. I think uh, it's something where authors tend to put one in place, and it should have been a period or should have been a comma. How how do you know? Um, one little uh, trick that I that I remember reading. I was doing a, an online workshop on grammar and punctuation. And the, the little trick to uh, help you know, do you use one or not, is um, could you follow the semicolon with uh, what are called fanboys? So for, and, nor, uh, but, uh, or, and yet. So those, those six words, is it a sentence that kind of could add to? So they're two separate sentences, and it could have added to the first sentence. And that's sort of, I don't think it's, um, I've noticed in, in, uh, Sometimes in my choices of do I use one or not, it'll often the rules might be a little subtler than that. But that is a general yardstick. That's a pretty safe, uh, a safe yeah. thing to to try it out with if you're if you're not sure. I do think that's a good way to like. I think one of the rules of the semicolon that I go by is like, are these thoughts related, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can use one of the fanboys, then yes, they are, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's a good indicator of that because the the semicolon to me does indicate that these two things are related to each other and it doesn't have to be as like as sudden as some other punctuation it's like a subtle connection but that's a clue to the reader that like these things are connected mm -hmm. um which can be a nice subtle tool instead of like an m dash or a colon or something that says yes this is definitely goes with this you mm -hmm. know right. Yeah, and I think another important point is it's in the definition itself. Two main clauses. So exactly. you're 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 talking about these are this isn't just an you know a, a, an addition to the sentence. You're not yeah. you're not just uh, you're not just inflecting and adding a bit more detail to an already complete sentence. You have two yeah. complete sentences that uh, but that are connected though to each other. Yeah, it has to be a full sentence. Mm -hmm. Or I will make it a full sentence That's when right. I get to edit it. Or I will delete <laughs> yeah. it entirely and you will be sad. Yeah, <laughs> because I was proud of you for using a semicolon and I had to remove it. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> that made me actually. Hey, I was some... so. Oh. It's, it's, it, it hurts. It hurts inside. <laughs> to get rid of a semicolon right. that we love. Um, it, 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 I, I, I just thought about this idea that um, that I certainly didn't really think about until maybe like a year ago. Uh, that sent that words like the fanboys actually can start sentences. Like I think that there's. I, I know. Like oh my god. <laughs> that sorry. was my mind exploding. Sorry for totally didn't have mind, control. but like. I, I often shied away from using words like and or but at the beginning of a sentence. Um, and I would assume that because they were conjunctions um, that I had to use other grammar to introduce uh, like a clause that began with one of those words. So I would mistakenly use semicolons often when a sentence really just was a new sentence. Um, mm. And once I got comfortable with the fact that I could start a sentence with the word and... I noticed that I was using semicolons much more accurately, much more appropriately. Um, yeah. But but it's it's odd, I think, that personally that I chose to rely on semicolons for. for well, for you know, there's some misconception I think that the fanboy words we're talking about um, don't have very much meaning. But if you go through and find sentences that start with yet, and you remove the yet. Well, then it's a totally different sentence. And I think a lot of times, especially like conjunctions and but, they don't seem like they have meaning. Um, and, and that's part of why, you know, we didn't really want them in the beginning of sentences. But when you go through and, and look at really good examples of them being used, you see that they change context and they really add to the meaning of the sentence. And I think that that's like a good, uh, if you can remove it and it sounds the same, shouldn't be there, Right. But if it's changing the meaning of your sentence, then by all means, start with it. Mm -hmm. I think it also depends on the style you're aiming for. If you want something yeah. that sounds very grand and formal, like uh, like there are some parts in my own writing, uh, because I write epic fantasy that's sort of channeling a little bit of Tolkien uh, in some of the language that I use, um, I'm more likely to use sentences with that kind of structure. If I was mm -hmm. writing sort of a uh, fast-paced action thriller, <laughs> I probably would not use so many. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I write start a, a lot of sentences like... with but in that case, though. You'd be like, but then this yeah. happened, and but he went that way, and but something came in from the ceiling. But wait. See, I write a lot <laughs> of like, young adults, and then you're totally okay starting with whatever fanboy you want. Because, you know, a, a kid is definitely going to be like, but that just happened. You know, they don't, I mean, right. your, yeah. your style has so much to do with, Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be like, heretofore, I had never seen that house before. <laughs> it's not going to happen in a young adult book if you want <laughs> young adults to read it. <laughs> As you're writing a Tolkien-esque epic fantasy, John, do you tend to use a lot of semicolons? Are you, do you find yourself using semicolons with any sort of frequency in your work? I wouldn't say I use a lot, but I do use them. Um, I think uh, it's, I get a lot of mileage out of all the punctuation. Um, the one I use the least uh, is the, the parentheses, but I think that's yeah. natural. If you're using them appropriately... Um, it shouldn't you, be there very often. No. I think I, I, think I have a... Like it's like an author interjection. Like it's an omniscient interjection. Yeah, that's right. It, it, that, and I think that's the problem. I mean, you, for example, if you read The Hobbit, uh, there's a, there are like whole clauses like that oh are gosh. inside parentheses, and that's an older stylistic thing. I mean, that was okay back at the time when when Tolkien was uh, publishing The Hobbit. It's ne now things have evolved. We don't we don't do that, especially in third person limited uh, third person limited fiction, which is you know a majority of what you see, either that or first person. Um, so uh, I I. There's actually, I think I have parentheses in one place, and it's a swear word. Um, and I did it because it just really suited the the thing. Is it? I mean, it, it's it's not an omniscient interjection because it's uh, it's a Manwin chapter, and he's narrating uh, sort of what he's what was going on in the battlefield, and and then the, the men are learning new swear words thanks to this <laughs> soldier that's joined them. And so, in the brackets is the new swear that he taught them. <laughs> so you know, in, right in my there. experience, parentheses work really well for jokes. Yeah, that's what they work yeah. really well for. Okay. Like, there's the humor <laughs> in this otherwise like maybe not funny thing. Like, I've seen really great jokes in parentheses that with with good effect. But so I finished reading right. a book uh, last month, 
that I mentioned in the last episode called an, Untra- an Unattractive Vampire. And Jim McDonnell uses uh, parentheses for that exact thing to, like, explain <laughs> jokes that you might... The, the, the joke is not actually being told. So he just throws one word in a, in, a par- in a parenthesis and is like, there you go, there's a joke, and it works really well. It's super effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's all down to the style, the voice, what you're trying to achieve. I think with Jim McDonald's book, um, I mean, he's, and I think I could put um, G. Derek Adams, uh, Asteroid Made of Dragons, that has a very, it sort of has a Piers Anthony vibe uh, to it. A lot of yeah. fun, a lot of a lot of playfulness and I think things like messing around with some of the things that you can, you can sort of use formal stuff, but use it jokingly and it yeah. works better than if you just use plain old, uh, you know, the things that you would use in standard narrative fiction. I agree. You know, weirdly enough, although I love the semicolon, like I don't use it very much in my own writing either. Um, so I just find that like a really well-placed semicolon, you're right. Like goes a really long way. Because mm-hmm. uh, the more you use it, the more people will notice and be like, why are you using this semicolon? Yeah. So the author who uses the most semicolons is uh, Faulkner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He has like one of the longest sentences in literature. It's in Absalom, Absalom. And I couldn't tell you what it is. It's like a whole page because he connects it with like yeah. 12 semicolons. And you're like, are you done <laughs> yet? So I would advise against that unless you are also Faulkner. Because yeah. you're not going to get away with it, you know? Like, I have seen a lot of, um, a lot of, like, if you're in that style and it's older and they connect, like, many clauses with semicolons. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as a reader, I'm just not, I don't like it. I, one semicolon for me goes a long way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's even, uh, like, the analog of a list, list with commas, yeah. where you have a list yeah. of clauses and you use the semicolon sort of to yeah, separate each clause. And I guess you have the Oxford semicolon. I don't know if it's oh, called yeah. that, but do you put it before the end or do you not? <laughs> I have run across this and it's really confusing. Uh, I've come across it mostly in academic writing. And I will oh. say in academic writing, I am for the semicolon in those lists because the, the items tend to be so complicated. Mm-hmm. But in fiction, if you have something like that, you just need to rethink the entire... Yeah. format well the you know in, in a chicago manual of style for uh lists wherein each item has punctuation is to use semicolons as a separator um, yeah i mean that's the rule but it's not easy to read so it's not, if you had it works for academia but like it would hardly work in fiction if you had like you know you, whoa hey sorry guys we're going for a ride <laughs> i knocked my computer over <laughs> dear listener um <laughs> and with that my thought evaporated. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say that unless you're writing academics, I would stay away from the semicolon. Yeah. And the, and then you don't have to think about an Oxford semicolon. Like, you don't ever have to have that thought, which is probably for the best. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think an important point, I mean, for this episode and the previous episode on commas is when you're writing a draft, you're getting your ideas down. Your sentences are going to be a lot more uh, raw and you're going to do a lot of, you're going to have, all kinds of stuff thrown in there. So, I mean, uh, once you once you revise or edit, I mean, uh, it's natural that there's going to be a lot of restructuring and questioning and, yeah. and condensing. So, so a lot of the semicolons and commas and various things you've used to get all your ideas on there aren't going to necessarily make it to the printed book. Yeah, yeah. I want to second that. I mean, it's um, I, I, all writers should know that what you're writing when you're working on a first draft will completely change uh, because editing is absolutely necessary um, whether whether yep. you do it on your whether you do it on your own just revising or whether and let's just skip straight into our ad or whether you uh, you know you leverage a company like story perfect editing services that's us um, and what we do is we edit books um, we we'll edit short fiction we edit novellas we edit novels we edit whatever it is that you've written dear reader dear listener um, but it's critical to, to edit your work, to go over it, because, um, you know, there's this kind of, when I was starting out, when I was first starting out uh, writing fiction of any kind, I was laboring under the, under the delusion that my first draft was my final draft. I don't know how many of you did that, um, but I, I would edit really, <laughs> yep. really heavily as I wrote. Um, and so I would, like, make it 
you know, I'd, I'd write like, you know, 50 or 60 words, and then I'd go back and edit those 50 and 60 words, and then I would write a little bit more and edit a little bit more. So that as I was writing, I felt like I had a really cohesive thing going. But um, what was really happening was that I was writing and then editing and writing and editing and writing and editing, and the thing had no, like, actual cohesive story because I focused so much on structure. Um, mm-hmm. And I wasn't very well versed in grammar yet, so I was editing wrong, and the thing was just a disaster. And so what John said is absolutely right. Like, when you're writing, just write. Just get the idea out. Just move forward because you will edit it. Someone else might edit it. But at the end of the day, your first draft is never going to be your final draft. Not going to happen. And this is one of the advantages, um, you know, maybe I'll extend your ad here. Please do, please do. Uh, One of the advantages of working with an editor that you hire is you can absolve yourself of that obsession um, because your your mind needs to be in making the writing as powerful as it can be. So, I mean, you know, you want to do some revision and, and get it into as you know, great shape as you can, but knowing that you're going to be working with an editor who's going to bring their expertise on board to help you, you know, direct some of your decisions is a, is a great idea. Uh, and then over time, you know, that ex- every time you get a book edited, you learn from it. So if you can also learn from the experience, you can carry that forward. And it's not like you're going to be uh, having a heavy duty editing job every time you sit down and get to that stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that about my own writing, uh, and once again, I'll talk about my experience as a marketing writer, but um, I had a very, just like a, an intelligent and kind and, and gifted uh, manager who, she edited all of my work and she taught me a ton, and my first few pieces that I wrote for her came back redlined like crazy, and as I worked with her, the red lines just kept shrinking and shrinking and fewer and yeah. fewer corrections because I was learning techniques from reading her changes. Um, and I think that I've become, in a, in a really remarkably short time, a much stronger writer for having been edited every single day. Uh, yeah. It really does help. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing quite like having your work edited to make you sound like you can write really well. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Let me just tell you that as a copy editor, my job is to make sure that there are fewer words on the page than when I started. Uh, and... And having an editor you trust means that the words that have meaning stay. And, and I think that's just like a really important part of Story Perfect is like, you know, we, I am not going to delete something that's like an essential part of someone's story. Like I have enough experience to know what matters and what doesn't. And, and being able to trust somebody, um, you know, I didn't start out knowing that. It took me years of, of working on PhD theses for like quarters, oh my gosh, <laughs> to get to where I am now, you know, and now I can be like, oh, you don't need that, you don't need that, and um, it's just really valuable, like, and, and even as editors, we need editors, so no one should feel like they're, you know, so above it, or that, you know, they can't, uh, they can't ask for help, because we all need it. Yeah, and it, being an editor, it's like having a role in an air. I used the co-pilot uh, analogy in our previous episode, but it is. It's like, you know, you need both. Uh, even even as editors, you uh, you can't. You might you might know how to fly the plane all by yourself, but you still need a co-pilot, and you need someone in that role who's not emotionally attached. Uh, and the other thing is, you know what you meant to say when you wrote what you wrote. Exactly. Not everyone else does. So the idea of an editor is that is someone else who's not you, who didn't write the story, who is looking at this objectively to make sure that it's, that it's going to be universally understood. Yeah, there's an intrinsic value to having uh, additional sets of eyes on your work. Um, be they an editor, be they a group of alpha and beta readers. Um, mm-hmm. what, you don't, what you don't want to do is write a story and wholly believe in it um, and put your entire like emotional well-being behind it and then have had nobody else look at it and submit it to anyone uh as a completed yeah. work because you yeah. people need to people need to to read it and tell you you know hey i loved this about it strengthen this or hey i got a little confused here um and those kinds of yeah. aren't personal judgments they're just like hey i want to help make your writing better and that's what all these editors want that's what we want and that's what you know your yeah. alpha and beta readers are going to want so beta readers are really undervalued because let me tell mm. you that if you write a manuscript that is filled with semicolons and your beta readers go through it, they're going to tell you what's with all these semicolons. Yeah. And so you're not even going to need an editor right away. Well, they're going to tell you this, this is weird. Exactly, right? It's like uh, if we're saying just yay or nay on the semicolon, we're somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah. The answer is yay, 
but you know, responsibly, semicolon responsibly. Yeah. <laughs> like, cause you know, a lot of readers can overlook, or if they don't necessarily understand a semicolon, one or two is not going to mess them up. Mm-hmm. But if you have mm-hmm. them on every page, let's say, they're going to start to think they're missing something, right? Like, mm-hmm. why are these here? What are, what is the author trying to tell me? Yeah. And if you don't have like an explicit intent, then they don't, they don't belong there. <laughs> I wonder if we can like subdivide punctuation into classes of like acceptable use and like, you know, use sparingly is kind of like the food. Maybe we, we could make a table probably, you know, yeah. uh, exclamation marks would go and use sparingly. Or, I say you like, get only in case of oh, yeah. life. Like, but you in case of emergency break glass life. and then throw out the exclamation point forever. Never use it. <laughs> There's a future it's... episode. Exclamation marks with three exclamation marks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. Don't. Stop three it. Stop, stop, he said, explaining. <laughs> They're a finite resource. Uh, it's like if there's a great Mitch Hedberg joke about uh, what if what if car horns, you had like a quote, like you had like a limit to the amount of times you could honk every month. Yep. So that, like, you know, you, something dangerous happens and you honk and it just goes like, <laughs> and you lament that you saw your cousin Ricky on the sidewalk because you just had to say hello, honking your horn. Um, yeah. That's how and really, the, are. you know what, though? Yeah, the same could be yeah. said for semicolons, because if you overuse them, they will lose their value, yep. which could be true for our previous episode on commas as well. Right. If they're too many, people are just going to start overlooking them because they think you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they can be used much more frequently because they're so common, right? Like, that's the whole notion of, like, this sort of food pyramid of punctuation. Like, yeah, they can be used frequently, but commas it's still are, like, a... the most common. And then you got your end dashes. You got your, like, I don't know. I've seen there's bulleted still... lists in, in fiction. Super there's a law of diminishing return for every punctuation mark. Yeah. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, it varies. So uh, I think you're right. We should make a table. We should, yeah. we should make a table. We should of have it in our resources acceptable. page, which we should make if we don't have one, which I think we do. Um, I have a recommended, uh, I was going to recommend a book, and I know I'd mentioned this when we were talking, it's, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Noah Lukeman, he is a literary agent who, he wrote a book called your, I believe it's your first five pages, or your first eight pages, uh, I'd have to, I don't remember offhand how many pages it was, but it's a very <laughs> popular, I want to say it's your first five pages, and it's about some of the big do's and don'ts. Uh, or things that people do in their submissions that tend to rule them out right away. Um, Very useful book, but he also wrote a book called A Dash of Style, which is all about the subtle art of punctuation, and he goes through all the different punctuation marks, and and what, what I like about that is he breaks outside of the technical manual box, because there are hard, fast rules, but in fiction there are exceptions, and he helps you to understand like just some of the considerations that go into when to, when to use them and when to not use them. Um, yeah, for so sure. definitely would in, recommend that you check that book out. Yeah, I'll put that, I'll put you that know, in the liner notes when, uh, when the podcast episode is released. So, And I will yeah. add that since, since we talked about dialogue in the previous episode, I think it's worth mentioning here that semicolons don't, for me, they don't really belong in dialogue. It's not that they can't, um, but I don't think they're effective in dialogue. Um, because you can't imply a semicolon when you're talking. Yeah, you it's really not imply someone a separate else... sentence. There's no... Yeah, there's, even there's if you're really like a no... highly intellectual person. Like, we were talking about this earlier in the episode, yeah. how, like, using a semicolon might convey this sort of intellect. Um, but in yeah. dialogue, I, th- I agree completely. I think that totally doesn't work. Um, it, yeah. it breaks down structurally. Yeah. Um, even if yeah. you think that it's technically correct, I just think it will read strangely. Um, because, you know, you can't... It's not something someone can hear. Yeah. So they'll, they'll, it does. They'll, they'll hear a pause as a comma or as a period. Yeah. So um, there's not really a compelling a reason. Right. There's not really a compelling reason, I think, to use one in dialogue. Um, maybe there are some exceptions, but I haven't I haven't found them yet. So. <laughs> yeah. One one thing that I want to throw in there quickly is uh, as, I know my, just as my experience as a writer and how I approach things like semicolons and commas. I mean, I know the rule. Being an editor, I know the rules. So as I'm writing. Uh, it's, I, I tend, I mean, there, yes, I make mistakes occasionally. I might just put the comma in the wrong place. I'm not thinking, but, um, I, I always look at what I'm doing as placeholders. So, you know, I might, I might put a semicolon somewhere that I don't, that's not my, I'm not 
right. determined that it's going to go there forever. But right. uh, I always make sure that what I write, if an editor, if this were to accidentally go to print, <laughs> the basics would be in place. But in terms of when you come back to revision and editing, you have a chance to rethink all of that. So, yeah. you know, don't, don't, I, I would just advise writers to not overthink when they're drafting where they yeah. put stuff, but just try to follow the rules and know that you can always come back and think deeper about, well, is this the perfect punctuation here? Do I yeah. need a semicolon? Can I do something different with this sentence? Well, you know, and that being said, John, sometimes my question as an editor, if I'm reading something and a semicolon belongs, but the writer has not used one ever, I hesitate to use a semicolon because I don't know if it fits with their voice as an author. Because if they don't know how to use a semicolon or it just didn't occur to them, then I don't want to insert it, if that makes sense. Like, add to their voice something that wasn't there. Um, but yeah. I might suggest it to them instead of just, like, hard replacing it. I might leave a comment hmm. for that author saying, you know, a semicolon would work here. Maybe you could think about adding it as part of it. What do you think? Um, because yeah. I hesitate to make... I feel like, for a small thing, it does seem like a big change to their voice as a, mm -hmm. as a writer. Yeah, one thing, I mean, I I have run into that before where there was a strange spot that required a different, I can't remember what the, I don't think it was a semicolon, it might have been an ellipsis. I'd never mm -hmm. seen anywhere where they needed an ellipsis before. Yeah. So what I what happened, I did a double take, and instead of putting the ellipsis in, I looked at the sentence and said, well, they have a tendency to phrase things a certain way. And I looked back at patterns, mm -hmm. and I realized what was wrong here wasn't that we need an ellipsis, but that the way that they're phrasing suddenly was inconsistent with their overall voice. Yeah. And that, that ended up being the fix. So so that's definitely a good point that, um, it, I mean, ultimately it's about consistent voice. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and I think sometimes it's sort of like you're on stage performing, you have that little tiny moment where you slip out of, slip out of the act, and yeah. that's, as an editor, you come in to say, ah, you know, that's what we're doing. We're trying to find, make sure that the performance is being put on is seamless. Yeah. Whatever exactly. that might mean. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I, well, we're, we're just about out of time. So uh, it kind of seems like we've already answered the closing question that I had, which was similar to last episodes, which was if you could shake every writer in the world at the same time and yell one thing at them about the semicolon, what would it be? It seems like we've already answered that. But if you guys want to just summarize your points before we go. Hmm. Oh dear. Well, for me, yeah. I like I think and maybe I'll jump in here. Um, I think I would add to what I said in the last episode about commas. Um, after you're done reading about commas in the Chicago Manual, or or um, one of my favorite books uh, for grammar references called the Little Brown Handbook, mm -hmm. Little Comma Brown. Uh, speaking about commas, it's it's got a great summary of uh, a lot of the rules of sentence structure. Um, paragraphs, um, punctuation, basically a whole breakdown. I, I would say add semicolons to that list. While you're at it, look at other punctuation, but you know, definitely focus on the comma. Semicolon is very nuanced. I, I, I would, don't obsess over it too much, yeah. but definitely know, know the rules. Yeah, maybe I would just yell, like, you are not Faulkner. Like, don't think <laughs> uh -huh, that's you're great. Your semicolon powers are so great that you can use them yeah. whenever you feel great. Semicolons come with great responsibility. So I would say use sparingly. You're just um, making me get witty here. I, should, I would want to shout maybe, don't wink at me. Don't be smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, I think that the, the recommendation uh, that, that John gave essentially boils down to have a really good set of resources like just next to your desk where you work. Um, I, okay. as I'm taking this editing course, I have like a Chicago manual and I also have this weird like fold out laminated Chicago manual short version. that's like three pages, but has a bunch of rules summarized. Um, and I'll just, I, because it's there, I'll glance at it pretty frequently and I found it really helpful. Yeah. So just, um, get a hold of some, some great grammar resources like the Chicago manual or, or the little Brown handbook. Um, I'll make one more recommendation. This is the book that I use is Strunk and White's The Element yeah, of Style. style. Mm -hmm. that's a, it's like that's a less... Yeah, exactly, right? It's mm. like 90 pages. It's super short. It's, it's easy been, to reference. It has been great. Like, recommended in every English class I took in college. My high school AP English teacher told me to get it. Like, it's My mom is an English professor, and she swears by it. Like it. Yeah. Well, and I think we mentioned this maybe in our POV episode, John. You said start with what you know. 
Hmm. So, like, that's a good rule for grammar, too. Start with what you know. And if it feels like the sentence isn't working and it requires more complicated grammar, then you should definitely get into it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the semicolon is not going to be the answer to every, like, two clauses that are near each other. You just have to start with what you know and then move up. And then if you're confused, just come to Story Perfect. Yeah, just that's get right. There. We'll help you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so that uh, that wraps up episode number five of the Right Right podcast. Thank you, podcasters, for joining me, and thank you, listeners, thank you. for joining us. Thank you. Um, stay tuned for next month's episode, and uh, that's just about it for now. Have a wonderful everything that you do. Bye.